This, of course, is just a brief update and very important video that I've been meaning to do a while, uh, for a while now, related to the Jelani Day case, um, before other serious issues that you folks have been mentioning will also be uh, addressed further, um, especially Daybell and some other key issues that have been looked at. So this is a Jelani Day update, very important update um, to this case. And <clears throat> before other key matters get addressed, um, which will be coming after, know that there are going to be a number of episodes in relationship uh, to Murdoch, most certainly. That's a very important topic of the day. Um, Dr. Eisenstadt, when he testified, brought up some interesting points, and I had to make certain that I refuted the entire argument uh, that Dr. Eisenstadt made and started to confront those issues head on because this is a very calculating individual. Uh, Murdoch is very different than most people and as a official attorney and so on, there's the potential he could have weaseled out uh, of certain key issues. And so, Understand, folks, that when I'm going uh, he heavily on a specific topic, it's for a reason. And so when it concerns the Murdoch case situation and so on, uh, look forward to that. It's going to be another video that specifically outlines different allegations around the boat case. And remember, folks, there's no one more manipulative than an official addict. Thank you again. More to come next. Today, one of the most important cases that we are in the process of finally solving. The new answers have come. An email thread included in the released documents contained a long list of questions that were first submitted to a news organization uh, by the news along with several answers. Among the information obtained from LaSalle County Pantograph found details about the circumstances under which Day's belongings were found, including his car, found by a high school student on his way to work at the Illinois Valley YMCA, his wallet, found by a person searching for their lost drone, his phone, found along Interstate 74 by a driver who pulled over to secure a load, his clothes, found by two unidentified and peculiar ISU students on the bank of the Illinois River. Sarah Raymond, deputy chief for the Peru police, told the Pentagraph the emails have been redacted from the FOIA and not released yet. The Jelani Day Joint Task Force collectively decided the information contained in that email must not be disseminated as it is an integral part of the investigation for right now. Pantograph published the information because it helps to shed light on the background of a case that has attracted significant public interest and concern. In the past year, Day's mother, Bolden Day, meaning Carmen, has used every opportunity to call attention to Jelani's investigation and spread information. Last October, she led a march throughout Peru, Illinois, with civil rights leader Jesse Jackson. I need you to see yourselves and see for yourself, right now, the area where Jelani's car was found, the area where the clothing was found, the area where the body was found, the distance between the three, Bolden Day stated to the crowd. None of this adds up. Until now, law enforcement agencies have not publicly disclosed the information about Day's belongings. After Jelani's car was found, police did report finding inside the vehicle clothes he was wearing in surveillance and on a surveillance camera before he went missing. The email containing the answers began with Raymond communicating with Special, Special Agent Siobhan Johnson from the FBI field office. I'm not sure if we should give everything. Should I do an in-person interview? Let me know, Raymond wrote on March 29th. The message shows Raymond consulting other law enforcement from the Jelani Day Joint Task Force, which includes the LaSalle County Sheriff, the Bloomington, Peru, and LaSalle Police, and Illinois State Police 
along with the Attorney General's Office and FBI Chicago Office. Peru Police Chief Bob Pizaca signed off. I have no problem from the Peru Police Department standpoint. In an effort to ensure we handle this appropriately, I would prefer we have a conference call to discuss before any decision is made. Chief Jamal Simonton wrote, Raymond told the Pantograph the information was not released to the reporter. An email to Simonton requesting comment on the matter was answered by a Bloomington police spokesperson who told the Pantograph that all questions must be directed to the Peru Police Department. The Jelani Day case is being investigated by a joint task force now. All members are working in coordination. All activities have been to ensure we do not compromise the investigation, stated Brant Parsley. Since we are part of the Joint Task Force, please refer all questions to the direct spokesperson for the task force, the Peru Police Department. No further discussion of the matter was included. The Pantograph provided the email thread to Bolden Day, who stated it shows that Bloomington police wish to distance themselves from the case. Jamal Seemington doesn't want anything put out about this at this time. Concerning law enforcement decision not to release it, they don't want you to know right now. After the task force collectively decided to decline sending the answers back to the reporter, available information became limited to the public. Emails show Raymond told members of the task force to deny interview requests and give a uniform response to inquiries. I enlisted the help of the FBI for the response. You are welcome and should use the first paragraph exactly as it states so that everyone is uniform in response. The last part you need to make your own and include the ongoing. There is no additional information at this time. That prepared response. The investigation into the demise of Jelani Day remains ongoing. Complex death investigations take time to investigate thoroughly, and Jelani Day, the Joint Task Force, is employing all available investigative techniques. Now, I'm going to look at that report. I'm going to look up what is going on with uh, Simon, Simonton. That's one of the most important elements. Mr. Simonton gave some specific information in an interview. And from what I have heard, okay, from what I have heard on this channel from specific sources that I have, okay, this information is explosive because it deals potentially directly with um, the issue of Stephen Bertolino Law. That's correct, folks. You heard it right here first. Stephen Bertolino Law. The law offices of Bertolino and PLLC. Now remember, you've heard on this channel since the beginning. Certain strange things were recovered, including a shattered iPhone. When the Pantograph last obtained LaSalle County emails in October of 2021, rumors had surfaced that Day's phone was found, but police did not return any uh, requests for comment. In the email that is never given to the inquiring reporter, Raymond wrote that the police had run the serial number for Day's phone through a law enforcement database and found it had been sold to an eco ATM on October 13th. An investigation then took place and found a male had found the phone on the side of Interstate 74. Police contacted the company, which still had the phone, and agreed to send it to law enforcement. However, because of Apple software encryption for the company's phones, Day's phone couldn't be broken into without the passcode. Investigators were able to retrieve a partial file system dump, but it did not contain the usable information required. Until software updates come out to break into the phone, we don't know what is even on it. Yet, Day's other belongings, Day's 2010 white Chrysler 300 was located in Peru, Illinois on August 26, 2021. A teenager saw it on his walk from La Salle to the Peru Township High School. Anyone who walks this path would see the car and knew it was not to be there. Bolden Day told the Pentagraph that the student had seen the car physically driving in that area on August 25th but didn't think to tell anyone right then. When the car was analyzed, they noticed that the license plate had been removed and scratched off and was not located. A state investigator used a metal detector, but the plate and its screws were never found. A lost drone led a young man to find Jelani Day's wallet, Raymond stated. 
His drone had GPS, and when he couldn't find it, he called his mother. His father recognized the name on Day's ID, and after an internet search, he called the police to, to report everything they found. She stated Peru police told her during the initial investigation that someone reported seeing Jelani walk down a residential street and actually throw his wallet. But they changed it to a boy who lost his drone instead. Jelani Day's clo clothing was a significant source of scrutiny. The hat and the t-shirt he was seen wearing on the day he was reported missing were found in the car, but his short socks and shoes were found three and a half weeks later in the Illinois River area. The email confirms the students found his clothing, but no further detail is included. Jelani Day's family has stated those students told police they went searching for clues in the La Salle, Peru area, and after they found the clothes, they retained attorneys afterward. His mother stated she has seen surveillance video recorded at ISU that showed Jelani Day talking with other people at the college. But in the email, Raymond wrote no one spoke to him that day or came forward to say they had. And the video shows that he never spoke to anyone, which is still a mystery. So why why did that occur? <clears throat> why, why did when they inspect the surveillance footage, it showed that he never spoke to anyone? Who was stalking, you know, Jelani Day? That's the question we really have to get to, right, folks? The FBI offered a $10,000 reward for anyone who would come forward. An investigative reporter expressed interest in August. Without comment, LaSalle County officials started to write in. Our fear is that the general public will see the report and feel the authorities are being silent. Bolden Day questioned the investigation. They are not doing what they are supposed to do. They haven't done what is needed to find out what happened. I'm not going to let it slip out of people's mind. I'm going to make certain that this is front page news. And that's what you need to do, folks. You need, you need to spread this news everywhere. It's a very, very important update. Um, but what has been, uh, what has been rumored, what I can say is officially being looked at, is there were actual bags and these are like specialty bags um, that you would see when they come with identifying body parts okay those types of bags were found in a basically a house a outlet owned by a certain law firm a certain famous attorney who's Name starts with the letter uh, B, okay? So he is fully connected to this whole situation for certain. That's right, folks. He is connected to this. The same one who has the law practice in Florida, he is connected to the Jelani Day case in more ways than one. All right, and I'm going to be looking at something very important here as an update related to what uh, Mr. Symington writes in, a, in another press release too. Thank you again. Make sure to get this out there far and wide for a very, very important update on Jelani Day. Close to the investigation state that Jelani Day's Verizon cell phone records show his iPhone turned off at 9.21 a.m. right after leaving Beyond Hello. But now we know an important detail based on Symington's interview that he officially finally gave, and that was Jelani Day was never seen on surveillance footage at any time at the school, at the college. Yeah, that one really blows one's mind. Then his cell phone is tossed from the car onto I-55. Another set of emails were released in the investigation. One email refers to extraction report Apple iPhone, noting 23 chats and 17 messages were found on Jelani Day's cell phone. These details were cross-referenced from Jelani's contact list. And you know why I find all this very interesting, right, folks? I promised you guys 
no matter what, we will get to the final ending, the final bottom of the Jujuani Day case. Uh, but somebody who enjoyed and loved their cell phones, who would carry multiple cell phone numbers all the time. Yeah, that's right. Is a certain attorney who has a famous name in the Chicago area. I think his name rhymes with Bertolino. Does that sound familiar? Yes, very, very interesting. The email noted six phone numbers of interest. I did not come forward to say that I remember talking with Jelani. Police recovered Jelani's car from the wooded area right off of an abandoned road in Peru, Illinois. Police did not comment on the contents of the journal so far, but what we do know is that there was no suicide notes or anything of the sort. More puzzling was Jelani's sneakers and shorts on the riverbank, north of where his body washed up. I know there are people who are withholding information. Well, you bet they are. You bet they are. Because now we know and confirm from what um, Detective Simonton uh, actually officially announced in one of his press articles is that they confirmed that he was never on the surveillance footage at the school, at the college. Therefore, everything that they released from the Peru investigation was possibly a lie, folks. Can you imagine how big of a detail that is? Right? They said over and over, Jelani Day was on surveillance video at the college. Well, guess what? They released the actual camera footage. Detective Simonton looked at it very closely. He released his official findings to the press. He gave another interview um, with the media. There was nothing showing Jelani Day there at that school. He was there at the entrance to the ISU, but he never met with any of these people or did any of the sort that was claimed by the Peru Department. So the Peru Department is either extremely out of their uh, element, incompetent, or there's just someone in the Peru Department who was covering this up. You throw them at the wall and see which one sticks is a better explanation. I'm going to say it was because they were covering this up, most certainly. Um, and the question then is, given that's the case, what do they know about what was contained in those phone numbers? You know, we will seek the final justice for Jelani, um, Jelani Day. I need you to make sure, though, folks, get this out there. Get this very important out, uh, update out to everyone that you can. And remember to mention the fact that it was confirmed he was not seen on the surveillance uh, camera at the school. Not at all in the way the investigation claimed that was done by the Peru police, which means something is just is fishy. And that's what matters there. A certain attorney apparently owns a number of fish processing plants, or allegedly his family has always been into that. Now his name has been released in court documents which will be going into uh, a lot of detail with that in the state of Florida. So the plot, as always, Thickens. And what do you feel? What are you thinking about the Jelani Day case and investigation with what's been uncovered now with these 23 different chat messages and things that they never talked about in any of the news that came out on Jelani? What are your thoughts? What are your feelings? As always, sound off.
officially in the comments below. Thank you. Lino Jr. In the private law offices of Paul J. Bertolino Jr. We are on to you. We know you know something. This is not far from the private law offices and it was a residential home law office for none other than Mr. Paul J. Bertolino Jr. In the very interesting area here, right in Chicago, Illinois, folks. Chicago, Illinois. Near the river where it all started. We know you know something. You clearly know a lot more then you're letting on. And you know what's interesting, folks? They would go to the boat club all the time. The boat club. Right down here at the LaSalle River. Paul Bertolino would go there. Certainly his official cousin would go there. Certainly another Bertolino um, who's been mentioned many times in these videos you don't have to go very far to figure out uh, who that's referring to. Would go down to the boat club and go in this exact neighborhood nearly all the time. And this is a very interesting area, folks. You don't see this every day. Keep out. And it says keep out for a reason. They are very, very private individuals out here. Because sometimes things happen. This type of area of Chicago, folks, sometimes things happen. Accidents happen. And they will try to later claim that what occurred with Jelani Day is just simply an accident. But we know that's not true. We know none of that is true. That's why they call this street Wolf Ram Street. It's near the private residence and sometimes law practice for a man known as Paul J. Bertolino. Look at that, folks. You couldn't even make this up. Directly in this property where I've been perusing and so on to really get a feel for the type of people who would go down to the boat, to the area where the boats are. You see this area where this, this gated off, totally gated off area with this giant green fence where you could clearly hide all sorts of things back there. It's just, it's a little strange. It feels like they could have hid something awful back there, to be honest. Because of the way that the property appears, because of the way that this area has been rumored for years to hide certain things or people who meet accidents sometimes. And that's what this gate looks like. You know, you could never, ever, ever stretch the truth on this one. That's what this gate looks like. It looks like a place where you would hide literally someone who met with an accident. And they don't care to uh, to do anything about this. They, you know, this is right in your face. And I'm sorry, I've read about past cases where someone was found in this area who had something terrible happen to them. So, this is, you know, nothing here is new. Newland Avenue? No, nothing here in the true crime community of possible uh, homicides or people who go missing, you know, while they're out for a walk. Nothing is new. And so it's right here at the edge of Newland Avenue. Yeah, Newland Drive or Newland Avenue and Wolf Ramp Street. And you would never be able to 
uh, make anything like that up. It's just, it's obscene. So, folks, we know. <clears throat> we know what they're involved in, okay? So I'm asking you once again, for the sake of Jelani Day and for the sake of justice, get this video out far and wide. Get this out to the general public. Let's get a lot more people looking um, at certain things like this and putting it under much closer scrutiny. Because I'm telling you right now, if they could come here to this kind of a, a uh, <clears throat> unusual area that just doesn't feel right, and they could also go and hang out once in a while at the docks and board the boats and things like that. If they could do things like that. And this is where, you know, Mr. Paul Bertolino and so on are from. If they could do things like that on a regular basis, then who's to say they couldn't have someone like Jelani Day sleeping with the fishes? So thank you again. I appreciate this. You, you folks are the reason that we do this. So I appreciate all the support you're able to offer. Get this out you know, far and wide. And get this out to people who can really study it. Thank you again. Much more right here. I've said it once, I'll say it a thousand times. It is awful. Okay? It is awful what happened with the Murdoch case. It is terrible what happened with, with Dylan Rounds and similar things. But folks, we need justice for Jelani Day. This Jelani Day case has taken a lot of twists over its, over its time period. And we need to get and receive justice finally for Jelani. So I appreciate all of you who can do, as you always do, spread the word. And make this be a big, big part of the news. Get it out there. We need answers. And although we have questions now, and more questions, we need answers to meet those questions. Thank you. As always, stay tuned and sound off in the comments.